uh, March the 21st, which is the spring equinox. The idea being that that's a time when um, life is being regenerated in nature. And so it was a kind of celebration of springtime. By blockading the gates, the women at Greena managed to prevent trucks from entering the base for a day. About 200 participated in this action, and several arrests were made by the police. Uh, later that year, there was another very big encirclement at Greenham. That was on uh, December the 12th, 1982. And 30,000 women came to make a big circle around the whole area. We'd worked out that if there were 15,000 or so, we could all just hold hands um, with quite widely stretched arms in a circle around the whole base. Many people began to understand the seriousness of this whole issue and how the women's protest at Greenham really touched um, something deeply in a lot of women, many of whom had not been active in politics before, not people who are members of political parties or involved in other peace organizations. Many who went that day, that December the 12th, said they'd never done anything like that before but they felt that the issue was now so frightening and so important that they couldn't not protest it. We wanted to make personal statements of why this issue was important to us. And so um, we asked women who came to each bring something that meant something to them in terms of their everyday lives. And those uh, things were put on the fence Women brought all sorts of things from home. Photographs of children, husbands, parents, relatives and friends. Babies' clothing, toys, living things. Anything to celebrate life. So the fence was covered with all these personal things. And what we were trying to do was kind of transform the spirit of the place and to reclaim that fence so that the fence was somehow ours. Uh, and not to do with death and killing, which is what the other side of the fence is about. Day after day, the women endured primitive conditions in harsh winter weather, and still they kept their spirits up. Yet, more attention was paid to the physical appearance of the women than to what they had to say about nuclear weapons. There was harassment. The authorities served eviction notices, cleared out campsites, even confiscated personal property. But whenever one camp was dismantled, another would spring up elsewhere along the Army base perimeter. Greenham Common thus became the symbol of the long-term commitment to oppose nuclear weapons. And as the women confronted armed soldiers and the police, they, not the Russians, not the Americans, became the enemy. And the women who are at this moment outside the base where the weapons have been stationed really feel terrified because the people who are most likely to kill them are not the dreaded Russians that we're always told we have to defend ourselves from, but it is indeed young American servicemen guarding the weapons. And the fact that women have demonstrated to make it very plain that you cannot be defended by weapons, you can only be killed by them, has actually been clearly focused on at that base. Because very, very directly it is made available to us by our own Minister of Defence that unarmed British women will be shot by Americans if we threaten the weapons. Which is rather strange because we had been told that the weapons were there to defend us against our enemy. Well, I think that everybody knows exactly what the arrangements are. In the last resort, our job is to protect the uh, essential life and uh, weapon systems upon which our freedom depends. And we have changed in no material way the relationships that exist in this matter from previous governments. The state always has more violence than we would ever have ourselves. You know, the police and the army can always be called in. What we have is strength of numbers and a commitment to ideas and a determination to try and turn this arms race around. And potentially there are many more of us than there ever are of the police or the army. 
And that's where I think our real strength lies. If you want to hold your peace, come and hold it somewhere else. Somebody has to do something about this. Come on. I don't want to hurt you. A campaign of peaceful protests and nonviolent actions to stop deployment led to arrests. In Britain, the Green and women were always the defendants, answering charges of obstruction, breach of peace, trespassing. Why have the women risked breaking the law and arrest in some of the actions? What's the motivation? Why do you think they feel strongly enough to do them? Well, I think it's because once you've taken full responsibility for your own actions, you can't allow your government or anybody else to do in your name what you disapprove of. And that means sometimes that you have to remove yourself and step outside the existing minor laws in order to prevent your government mistakenly believing that they have your permission to plan for genocide and therefore that you would conspire with them by your silence. So we've had to break the law, we've had to go before the courts and it was then that we discovered of course that our courts were not there to listen. We couldn't sue the United States government in England because it's not subject to the British courts. We couldn't sue the American personnel on the base at Greenham because there is uh, an agreement between uh, the American government and our British government, which has been enacted into our domestic law, which exempts all American servicemen in our country from any form of penalty in the courts, whether civil or criminal. That's a very, very contentious law. We wanted to make it clear to people that cruise missiles in Britain are not under our government's control. They're NATO weapons, uh, so-called, but we don't believe that NATO is a partnership of equals and we believe that NATO is very much dominated by the United States. And in the base at Greenham, there are United States military personnel who have sole control over those missiles. And ultimately, they're under the control of President Reagan, which is why he's the um, prime defendant in our lawsuit. Well, I think it began in the summer of 1983 and at that time I'd been representing women from Greenham in the British courts for about 18 months and we'd many times gone into the British courts and argued that the deployment of cruise missiles in Britain was illegal and we never got anywhere with it. Now this was always by way of defence to criminal charges against the women. So in the summer of 1983 women were asking um, can we not go into court on our own account? Can we not put the really guilty parties into the dock and make them answer for what's happening? And I thought about this and I consulted with other lawyers and I said I don't think it's a very good idea to try and do this in the British courts. But the idea arose that we might try it in the American courts. And uh, we borrowed a few a uh, hundred pounds, enough to get me the airfare to come over to the United States. And I ended up in New York at the end of August 1983 and came to CCR, the Centre for Constitutional Rights, and met with the lawyers here. And we had a number of meetings in the first week and established that they would take the case for us uh, and back us all the way through the federal court. That's how it began. The entire staff at the Centre for Constitutional Rights was impressed when the Green and Women came to us with the urgency of the situation about cruise missiles and with the creativity with which the women were approaching in Britain the struggle against cruise missiles and the creativity they wanted us to exercise on their behalf here. On November 9, 1983, the Center for Constitutional Rights filed a lawsuit in the U.S. District Court in Manhattan against President Reagan, as well as against Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger, Secretary of the Army Vern Orr, and Secretary of the Air Force John Marsh. The court case that has been brought about in the United States, I don't think has really fully been understood by very many people in my own country, and it has hardly scraped the surface of a country your size. But we are actually preparing a case against the President of the United States, the administration that insists that the best way to defend everybody is to build bigger, or uh, to be more exact, smaller and more deadly accurate weapons with such, such wonderful terminology attached to them as more kills per pass. The case is significant because it is the first time 
that there has been a legal challenge to a specific nuclear weapons system that has identified what is illegal about that weapons system in a way that the judicial system can deal with or can at least try to deal with. Uh, it is also significant because it is an important effort in international cooperation to stop the nuclear arms race. We have British plaintiffs and we have members of the U.S. Congress coming together to oppose the deployment that the political processes in both countries have been powerless so far to stop. The lawyers handling the cruise missile case obtained amicus briefs from 158 European and American organizations, as well as testimonies from 30 expert witnesses in international law, weapon systems, science, ethics, psychology, medicine, and public health. The deployment of such weapons threatened the right of survival and is illegal under international law. The evils caused by this method of making war are greater than any conceivable evil which the war is intended to prevent. It is inevitable that mistakes will happen. The majority of those injured in a nuclear attack on or near an urban area would receive no proper medical attention. The occurrence of an accident while transporting or launching a land-based cruise missile may result in its structural disassembly thereby releasing an amount of plutonium into the environment. In the case of the British people, with the installation of the American nuclear weapons, there is a stronger sense of fear of annihilation, of annihilation of themselves, their families, people they've known, their country, their environment, and it's terrifying. Of course, people go on with their ordinary lives, but they have a double image or lead a double life. On the one hand, going about business as usual, and on the other hand, having the sense that everything could be destroyed at a given moment. All those feelings were intensified by the installation of these missiles. One of the things that's very important about the case legally is that it is going to spur the U.S. court system to deal seriously with its obligation to apply international law standards. It has always been understood, if one was to, to have international law taken seriously, it would mean that under certain circumstances, foreign policy would be um, not given a free reign, that there would have to be certain adjustments made. And what the people who advocate international law feel is that their views are those of loyal Americans or people loyal to the country they find themselves in, but that it's better for that country uh, if it is forced to obey international law, just as it's better for most individuals to be obliged to uphold domestic law. The Greenham plaintiffs insisted that the deployment of cruise missiles violates not only international law, but also the separation of powers as mandated by the U.S. Constitution. The deployment of cruise missiles, because they are first-use nuclear weapons, violates the constitutional separation of powers between Congress and the President by shifting to the President the power to declare war that has been vested in the Congress by the Constitution. That's why two members of Congress became plaintiffs, Ron Dellums of California and Ted Weiss of New York. When you have, for example, submarine-launched missiles which will arrive within 10 to 15 minutes from launch, or where you have the Persian II missiles which may arrive within 6 to 10 minutes of their being launched, um, you don't have the time to even wake up the president if he's sleeping, if this occurs at night when he's taking a nap, never mind have him be able to make a rational judgment as to whether, in fact, uh, it's a real launch or whether it's just some mistake on the, by the computer. What you do is rely on the machines to make the judgment. Well, that turns our constitutional system inside out because under our system of government, the uh, President of the United States is not permitted by himself to declare war. That's a power that's uh, given directly to the Congress of the United States. Uh, now, here we would have a situation where, never mind Congress not being able to declare a war, even the President wouldn't be in there. It would be one computer 
making a judgment as to what another computer had done uh, and declaring war for the people of the United States.